He doesn't know this, but way back years ago, you were talking at an event in San Diego, and I came and heard your talk. And I know you were working with Dennis Cassanchi a bit. And all over these years, David has just become more and more stronger in everything he's done. And he works with everybody across the country, Copic and everybody. He's the co-founder of World Beyond War, which you all know, and so many other things. I'm just going to bring him up now and thank him for coming all the way from Virginia to see all of you. And, and also, buy his book. There's some books left over. Buy them. He signed them all. It will help him. Uh, you know, a little money for him. David Swanson, come up here. This choir. Uh, I thank you to Frank and to and to Lila who couldn't be here, and to, to Harvey Wasserman who couldn't be here, and to Jody and and everybody in this room. Uh, I'm going to pass around a uh, a two sentence declaration of peace that people have signed in 175 countries that you can also sign at WorldBeyondWar.org or you can sign it on this piece of paper if you're so inclined. Um, so like. Perhaps most people who visit Los Angeles, I consider it my duty to offer a brilliant new idea for a film script. And my idea is in the genre of science fiction mafia, which I think is a genre that has been insufficiently exploited. In, in this film, the protagonist wakes up to the fact that without knowing it, he has somehow joined the mafia. And I think people will be able to relate to this story because I believe that this entire damn country either has become aware or needs to become aware that it has joined the Mafia. How do major U.S. newspapers and television news programs refer to the murder of an Iranian general? Never with the word murder. Often with words like deal with or take out. Trump had to deal with him. You could read an article like that about a guy who's famous for hiring somebody to put his name on a book called The Art of the Deal and imagine that Trump has made a bargain with Soleimani rather than blew him up with whoever was nearby. There have been societies studied by anthropologists that were literally incapable of understanding, much less committing, murder. But you would only have to be incapable of understanding mafia talk to be bewildered by a U.S. newspaper. I would like to live in a society where took him out indicates that you went with a friend to a restaurant and had a nice meal. But first, we are going to have to create a society in which a murder is referred to as murder. Assassination comes closer, but it is beginning to be treated as potentially acceptable, whereas murder still means unacceptable. So-called progressive... Unless it's the LAPD. Yeah. So-called progressive senator Chris Murphy, who days earlier had mocked Trump for being weak and not making enough people in the Middle East, quote, fear us, listened to a secret White House explanation of why the Trump family, I, I use family in the mafia sense, had taken out Soleimani. And Murphy denounced the explanation as utter nonsense, but labeled the murder, quote, a strike of choice. Remember when Trump said he could get away with murder on Fifth Avenue? Maybe he could. But if you, if one of you in this room killed someone on Santa Monica Boulevard, you could not tell the police, well, yes, officer, I shot that man, but it was a strike of choice, and I never apologized for my strikes of choice. That would make me look weak, and I would like you now to help me wave my personal flag. Nor could you crib from Obama and say, let me be clear, officer, the guy is dead now, and it's our job to look forward, not backwards. Uh, nor could you pull a George W. Bush and announce that your victim was an imminent threat and could potentially have become an imminent threat, given enough time and U.S. weapons, or that he had sh himself shot somebody else last week, or that you had a dream in which he was planning to attack four U.S. embassies with a ray from a Death Star. I mean, you could say these things, but you would be locked up for saying them. Now, the fact that people in the U.S. all talk a little bit like they're in the mafia doesn't make them the mafia any more than they're borrowing phrases from Star Wars for their various pretentious rebellions or their new branch of the U.S. military makes them 
Can some space warriors who can breathe without oxygen travel faster than light, survive technology worse than nuclear weapons with a culture worse than ISIS, and have magical powers that turn on and off with orchestral music that permeates all space-time from an unknown source? The question is, why does the United States talk like the Mafia? Well, why would a mafioso avoid using the word murder and employ various euphemisms and code words instead? Perhaps to deceive himself, but certainly in order to avoid incriminating himself if he's overheard. If cops weren't potentially listening, then I made him an offer he couldn't refuse might have been simply if less dramatically stated as I threatened to kill him. But why would a U.S. journalist talk about Trump dealing with Soleimani? The journalist isn't guilty of murder. He or she can simply say that Trump murdered Soleimani. Yes, but he or she or his or her editors or their owners have identified with the U.S. family. I use family in the mafia sense. And the cops aren't listening, but we are. We, the people, are the cops in this analogy. If we read in our newspapers that the 45th U.S. president in a row has committed murder, eventually we might start to question that. If instead we hear that Trump has taken out a scary threat with a strike, whatever kind of strike, there's nothing much wrong with a strike after all, well then we can move on to the sports game or the summer weather in winter that we revel in like insects enjoying a rain puddle on a freeway just before rush hour. We, we are all in the mafia because we are all engaged in murder and we are all trying to hide that fact from all of us. Even opponents of a war on Iran or any of the current wars tend to avoid ever mentioning the principal thing that wars do. We are eager to tell each other that such a war would cost money or hurt what are called our troops or change Iran in exactly the opposite way purportedly intended, or even risk nuclear apocalypse, or damage the natural environment, or shift money to the wealthy, or strip away liberties, or brutalize society, but never that it would kill, injure, traumatize, and render homeless huge numbers of human beings, albeit non-US human beings. That is what a war is. All of those other things are the side effects. They should all be listed on the bottle and read carefully before opening, but they're not what war is. What war is must never be mentioned or understood. I'll give you an example. Last week, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar mentioned that she suffered PTSD as a result of being traumatized by war as a child. Of course, the vast majority of those killed, injured, traumatized, or given PTSD by war are civilians. And disproportionately, they are children and the elderly. And overwhelmingly, they are on one side when a rich nation attacks a poor one. But these basic facts have been so diligently hidden that people <coughs> screamed out in outrage that only US troops are permitted the status of having PTSD. Now, I don't think you could find a single troop who thought of it as a status or wouldn't gladly give it up. I think many suffer simultaneously from brain and other injuries as well as moral injury, compounding the PTSD in particular ways. But the moral injury is because they know what they've done. Because they've stopped, sometimes very abruptly stopped, imagining that war has no victims. Imagine the absurdity of telling Congresswoman Omar that the people bombed and occupied and forced to flee and mourn and go hungry and face disease epidemics don't suffer. That someone sitting in a trailer in Nevada pushing buttons can be traumatized, as indeed they can, while someone living beneath the constant buzzing of a deadly drone that can end life at any instant cannot be traumatized. After all, such a person is foreign and has dark skin and ought to be used to toughing it out, right? Americans aren't used to such affairs and need to be given a little more consideration, don't they? Now sometimes it's admitted that an assassination is a killing, and sometimes that it's an act of war, and sometimes that particular actions within a war can be illegal. <coughs> but virtually never that an assassination is illegal, or that war itself is illegal, or that assassination is murder, or that war is a collection of murders. When Trump threatened to bomb Iranian cultural sites as revenge for the 1979 hostage taking, he was doing an awful thing in many ways. He was threatening wonderful beauty and history. He was, in the imagery of the Godfather, using revenge as a justification for slaughtering a prize horse and sticking its bloody head in somebody's bed. 
He was perpetuating widespread misunderstanding of what happened in 1979. He was provoking anger and retaliation. But the outcry in the US media was almost entirely war crime. It's worth noting that we don't have rape crimes. If Harvey Weinstein both rapes you and makes you read really bad dialogue, we aren't supposed to declare the latter to be a rape crime and ignore the rape itself. We don't have armed robbery crimes, where if you rob a store and knock over a shelf, you're legally guilty of knocking over a shelf as an armed robbery crime, with the robbery itself being acceptable. We don't have animal cruelty crimes, where if you torture a dog and make too much noise doing it, the latter is an animal cruelty crime, while the animal cruelty itself is just a strategic household security imperative. It's not that I don't want people to be outraged about threats to cultural sites. It's just that I want them outraged as well by threats to human lives. And I want it admitted that war is itself a crime, that it is banned under the UN Charter, with narrow exceptions that are never met, that it is banned under the Kellogg-Briand Pact, with no exceptions. Both war and murder are crimes. It is a crime under Iraqi law to murder someone in Iraq, just as under US law to murder someone in the US. It is a crime under international law to commit war in Iraq, just as it would be in the US. War is murder by military. Murder is war without military. The legal and moral distinction between murder and war is not and should not be what people suppose. And the distinction should not be a question of who the victims are. Remember, last week, when Trump had murdered people in Iraq and Iran had threatened to retaliate, and Trump had already threatened to re-retaliate should Iran retaliate. And even after Iran had launched missiles, the big question in the United States media was, what should be done if any Americans die from Iranian actions? There was, this was the overwhelming concern. If mere Iraqis were to die, there seemed to be virtually no concern that World War III would be required. We saw the same phenomenon during Obama's drone murder spree. US victims generated the majority of the disturbingly tiny amount of opposition in the corporate media. But when Trump murdered Soleimani, the major concern among Democrats in Washington was that he hadn't done it the way Obama would have done it. Yeah. Obama would have properly notified a handful of Congress members. Obama would have refrained from tweeting about it. Obama would have expressed grave regrets and cited the moral <coughs> quandaries of Christian saints rather than Fox News hacks. Obama would have provided his victim with a proper Muslim sea burial. But the Obama era through his actions and activists' inactions and the corruption of the media and Congress and other factors gave us this era that we're in. Murder was normalized. Progressive law professors testified to Congress that drone murders were horrible, indefensible murders unless they were part of a war, in which case they were totally fine. <laughs> now they've become so totally fine that we're told that the murder of Soleimani is only a problem if it starts a new war. If it's just a murder, then it's just the family business, which might be called Murder Incorporated. It'd be a good book title, I think. Um, only part of the family has been feeling a little disrespected. Congress members want to have some say about wars, at least sometimes with some wars when the president belongs to the other party. The most common claim about the legality of war in the US media is that it is illegal unless authorized by Congress. In fact, Congress does not have the legal power to authorize rape or robbery or dog torture, and war is as illegal as those other things. If Congress will use its power to prevent or end a war, I'm 100% in favor. But the notion that Congress can use its power to make a war legal is a dangerous one. Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia has long tried to give presidents more wa war powers by, while claiming to be doing the opposite. And even his claims have nonsensically normalized war. On my YouTube channel, you can watch me questioning him at an event where he faulted Trump for sending missiles into Syria without asking Congress. Could Congress possibly have legalized the crime of sending missiles into Syria? I asked him. He admitted it could not. And returned within seconds to the same nonsense he'd been saying before. This month, however, just recently, he actually introduced a resolution, however weakly worded, to force a vote to end war on Iran. 
which succeeded in the House before going to the Senate. Now, a big focus on the efforts to erase the illegality of recent wars and murders is this notion of imminent threat. As with many war lies, there is an answer to the question of whether Soleimani was an imminent threat, but it is the wrong question. There were no weapons in Iraq in 2003, but the question of whether there were had nothing to do with the morality or legality of attacking Iraq, except in the sense that the disaster would have been even worse had Iraq actually had those weapons. Soleimani was apparently on a peace mission when he was murdered, but the question of what he was up to has nothing to do with the morality or legality of killing him. If he had been indicted for a crime, he could have been arrested and prosecuted. If he was planning more attacks on ISIS, the United States could have stopped taking that personally. If he was planning attacks on US troops, any number of diplomatic steps, including removing those troops from illegal and catastrophic endless occupations, were possible. But a preemptive strike, otherwise known as an aggressive strike, is a crime. It's made to look heroic in movies, but is still criminal and insane in real life. In the Mafia, there is never any discussion of the financial cost of taking care of somebody. On the contrary, taking care of him is necessary for the family's interests, or for making sure people fear us, as Senator Murphy wants. If I were to go on CNN and propose educational, or green energy, or health care, or housing programs, what is the first question I would be asked? Are you gonna pay for it? Are you gonna pay for it? And if I were instead to propose sending more troops to Iraq, would I ever in a million years be asked that question? No. no. War either costs nothing, or we shout about how much it costs by naming some fraction of military spending, as if the rest of military spending is for something other than war. I think this is as good a moment as any to tell you my budget idea. An important job of any U.S. president is to propose an annual budget to Congress. Should it not be a basic job of every presidential candidate to propose one to the public? Isn't a budget a crucial moral and political document outlining what chunk of our public treasury should go to education or environmental protection or war or whatever else? The basic outline of such a budget could be a list or a pie chart communicating in dollars or percentages how much government spending ought to go where. It is shocking to me that presidential candidates don't produce these. As far as I've been able to determine, though it's so absurd as to seem improbable, no non-incumbent candidate for U.S. president has ever produced even the roughest outline of a proposed budget, and no debate moderator or major media outlet has ever publicly asked for one. There are candidates right now with major proposals to change education, health care, environmental, and military spending. The numbers are vague and disconnected. How much? What percentage? What goes where? Some candidates might like to produce a revenue or taxation plan as well. Where will you raise the money is as good a question as where will you spend the money. But where will you spend the money seems like it ought to be the basic minimum. The U.S. Treasury distinguishes three types of government spending, as you all know. The largest is mandatory, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Care. The smallest of the three types is interest on debt, but in between is discretionary spending, the spending Congress decides what to do with every year. What every candidate ought to produce is a basic outline of a federal discretionary budget, which would be a preview of what they would ask Congress for. If they want to produce larger budgets that include mandatory spending, etc., so much the better. President Trump is the one candidate for president in 2020 who has produced a budget proposal. In fact, one for each year he's been in office. As analyzed by the National Priorities Project, Trump's latest budget dumps 57% of discretionary spending into one thing alone militarism, war, and war preparations. Despite the fact that Homeland Security is separate from that, the Energy Department, which is vastly nuclear weapons, is separate from that, Veterans Affairs is separate, etc. The U.S. public, in polling over the years, has tended to have absolutely no idea what the federal budget looks like, and once informed, to favor a very different budget from the actual one at the time. 
I am curious what each person campaigning for the presidency would want. Will they put their money, or our money, where their mouths are? They say they care about many good things, but will they show us how much each thing? I strongly suspect that most people would recognize the major differences and have strong opinions about them if we got a basic pie chart from each candidate. Now when I say that the United States is the mafia, I don't mean that we are all the same, that nobody is doing good. Here's a room packed full of people doing good. I do mean the society as a whole not just the government, and certainly not some shadowy room where eight guys with cigars decide everything. Our problems would be a lot easier in most ways and a lot harder in others if the world worked like that. The reality is very different. We have a pseudo-representative oligarchy with various power centers, with ideologies rolling recklessly toward the cliff of World War III, and with certain parties licking their lips for dollars or blood, while others are coming to the grips with the possibility that they've gone too far. Many of us have a fondness for whistleblowers. Even beyond our respect for people who were always right, we like the stories of people who were wrong and then saw the light and took courageous risks to expose wrongdoing. But how do you blow a whistle on a whole society? Whom do you expose it to? You have to expose it to itself. You have to intervene as a member of society to correct society while society tries to remain anonymous like an alcoholic and avoid publicity about what it's done. At World Beyond War, we're working on cultural changes as well as structural changes like divestment from weapons and closure of bases and these factors all interlock. If people were ashamed to profit from weapons, it would be far easier to divest from them. And if there were less profit in the weapons, it would be far easier to make people ashamed of them. Last spring, some of us asked the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live, to divest from weapons and fossil fuels, and they did so. And one place we took the idea next was Arlington, Virginia. And I spoke to one of the county board members there. And he told me without the slightest hint of embarrassment that it would be hard for Arlington to divest from weapons because first, Boeing had bought them a nice park, and second, because the National Cemetery full of war dead was there in Arlington. Now, think about that second one a minute. It has always, always been important in starting wars to get some Americans killed so that more can be killed in some sort of sick honor of the earlier ones killed. But here, this was advocacy for getting more people killed. Of course, 95% of them would likely be non-Americans, but getting more people killed in unspecified future wars in honor of the dead from all past wars. Now, perhaps the idea is this. If we outgrow the barbarism of war, if we cease producing rows of corpses, then we will be putting on airs and suggesting some sort of superiority to the people already rotting away in row after row of war graves. I think this confuses individuals with society. A society can improve, or worsen for that matter, without its constituent individuals changing their attitudes toward dead people. Our society claims to be superior to slavery and puts slave owners all over its money and its monuments. Yes, somebody shouts out, but slavery is gone because of war. You can't hate slavery if you don't love war. Someone actually said this to me yesterday at the Rotary <laughs> Convention in Ontario, California. <laughs> no, you can't watch me. I can, even, I can even do it while disliking the lousy education that denies people the knowledge that most of the world ended slavery without wars. But what you think of the U.S. Civil War? need not determine what you think of an individual person who was caught up in it. And what you think of the Civil War shouldn't alter the fact that nobody proposing any major legal changes now, such as a Green New Deal, is proposing that first we find some fields and slaughter millions of young people and then pass legislation creating a Green New Deal. We are in a society that is superior to that, whether we like it or not. Many people, however, are still far too ready to support wars on distant foreigners and to support the weapons industry that supports the wars because of their belief that foreigners often need some killing to straighten them out. <laughs> One way to increase opposition to the weapons industry that we don't take enough advantage of is to make people aware that it's a global monster with no flag or fight song 
that U.S. weapons stocks rise on the threat of U.S. wars, but not merely because the U.S. government will use their weapons. <coughs> Most wars have U.S. weapons on both sides. The U.S. government not only markets and approves the foreign sales of U.S.-made weapons, but it gives other governments billions of dollars every year on condition that they use it to purchase U.S.-made weapons. If you unquestioningly support U.S. militarism, then you support whatever Egypt, Israel, and numerous other nations do with their free weapons. I suspect that few taxpayers in the United States knew they were giving weapons money to Ukraine until the topic came up during an impeachment of Donald Trump. Just as few people even in Congress seemed to know that the United States had troops fighting in Niger until a scandal developed around what Donald Trump had said to the widow of a soldier killed there. Perhaps it is the case not only that wars are how the U.S. public learns geography, but also that weird scandals are how the U.S. public learns about U.S. wars. The U.S. government also provides military training to other governments' militaries around the world. Sometimes this supports an existing government, such as a brutal dictatorship in Bahrain, and sometimes to overthrow it, such as in Bolivia, but always to militarize. The U.S. government also maintains military bases in numerous other countries, bases that sometimes serve to prop up unpopular governments, such as in <coughs> Afghanistan, or to assist them in their foreign wars, such as in Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen. So even U.S. government militarism is not limited to the wars of the United States. Not only does U.S. militarism extend well beyond the patria, but it extends into places that call into question one of the most common justifications for militarism. We're often told that wars and war preparations are aimed at protecting the world and human rights from dictatorships and oppressive governments. The wars are for freedom. Yet U.S. weapons companies, with U.S. government approval and assistance, and the U.S. military, are, in a variety of ways, supporting most of the worst governments and dictators on Earth and have been doing so for many years. Uh -huh. Donald Trump has expressed an embarrassing fondness for various authoritarian leaders, but supporting authoritarian leaders has always been part of U.S. governmental policy, regardless of political party. <laughs> In fact, while Trump has been criticized severely for talking with the leader of North Korea, the standard U.S. approach to the most dictatorial leaders on Earth is to arm them and train them. This fact makes the outrage over talking with one of them seem so out of place that one has to assume the U.S. public is generally ignorant of what's going on. In 2017, Rich Whitney wrote an article for truthout.org called U.S. provides military assistance to 73% of world's dictatorships. He was using the word dictatorships to mean oppressive governments, whether or not dictatorships. And his source for a list of these oppressive governments was Freedom House, a U.S.-based, U.S. government-funded organization with clear U.S. government bias. A list from Freedom House is as nearly as possible the U.S. government's own view of other countries. Out of 200 countries or so on Earth, Freedom House deems 50 of them to be, quote, not free. Of those 50, the U.S. government arranges for, and in some cases provides the funding for, U.S. weapon sales to 41 of them. That's 82%. Beyond selling and giving weapons to oppressive governments, the U.S. also shares with them advanced weapons technology. This includes extreme examples like the CIA giving nuclear bomb plans to Iran, or the Trump administration seeking to share nuclear technology with Saudi Arabia, or the U.S. military basing nuclear weapons in Turkey even as Turkey fights U.S.-backed fighters in Syria and threatens to close NATO bases. But let's look at the list of 50 oppressive governments and see which ones the U.S. provides military training to. Now this varies from a small course with a few people in it to endless courses with thousands of, of people trained, but the U.S. provides military training of one sort or another to 44 or 88 percent of those governments. Again, this list does not seem like a few statistical oddities to me, a few bad apples, but more like an established policy. I suspect that many in the United States didn't know that in 2019, these many years after September 11, 2001, the U.S. military was training Saudi fighters to fly airplanes in Florida until one of them made the news by shooting up a classroom. 
In addition, the history of U.S. provided military training to foreign soldiers through facilities like the School of the Americas, renamed Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, provides an established pattern of not just supporting oppressive governments, but bringing them into being. In addition to selling or giving oppressive governments weapons and training them, the U.S. government also funds their militaries. <coughs> of the 50 oppressive governments listed by Freedom House, 32 receive so-called foreign military financing or other funding for their military from the U.S. government. And it is extremely safe to say there is less outrage in the U.S. media or from U.S. taxpayers over that than we hear over providing food to people in the United States who are hungry. <laughs> Of the 50 oppressive governments, the U.S. military supports in at least one of the ways I've discussed, 48 of them, or 96%, all but the tiny designated enemies of Cuba and North Korea. <laughs> With some of them, the U.S. military also bases a significant number of its own troops, I mean over 100 U.S. troops in those countries, Afghanistan, Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Thailand, Turkey, United Arab Emirates. Cuba should be on this list as well, but it's a different story that troops are there against the will of the Cubans and not in support of the Cuban government. And of course, the Iraqi government has now told U.S. troops to get out. In some cases, the military engagement goes beyond these steps. The U.S. military is fighting a war in partnership with Saudi Arabia against the people of Yemen and fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in support of oppressive governments by the U.S. government's own definition, that were created by U.S.-led wars. Another source for a list of dictatorships is the CIA-funded Political Instability Task Force. Uh, as of 2018, this group had identified 21 nations as autocracies. But taking, taking dictatorships as a subcategory of horribly oppressive governments and consulting various sources, I come up with this list of dictatorships supported by the U.S. military. Bahrain, Brunei, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Eswatini, Gabon, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, South Sudan, Sudan, Tajikistan, Thailand, Turkmenistan, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, and Uzbekistan. <laughs> These are places whose leaders would have war propagandists drooling in excitement if the United States were to target them. These leaders make Noriega, Gaddafi, Hussein, Assad, and others the United States has first supported and then turned against look good. And we could add Yemen to this list, perhaps, as a place where the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have spent years destroying the place to restore a dictator. Yeah. Let's take just the first item on the list alphabetically, Bahrain and Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa. This guy has been the king of Bahrain since 2002, when he made himself king of Bahrain, prior to which he was emir of Bahrain. He had become emir in 1999 due to his two major accomplishments of first existing, and second, his father dying. The king has four wives, only one of whom is his cousin. <laughs> Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa has dealt with nonviolent protesters by shooting them, kidnapping them, torturing them, imprisoning them. He has punished people for speaking up for human rights and even for, quote, insulting the king or his flag, offenses that carry a sentence of seven years in prison and a hefty fine. So I'm going to skip over pages of how horrible this guy is, but I think you get the sense. And Bahrain is one of many. On Thursday, this week, the New York Times published a 9,000 word love letter. That's much longer even than this speech. 9,000 word love, love letter to the royal dictator of the United Arab Emirates, claiming that such anti-Islamist dictators must be supported very reminiscent of all the justifications, even very recently, even in places like Syria, for supporting uh, anti-communist Islamists or anti-government Islamists. When the US government wants a war, it will point to human rights abuses, which it may or may not have helped facilitate, as reasons for the war. They are no such thing. Wars are horrible for human rights. And the US government, is not in the business of spreading human rights. Where wars begin in the world does not correlate with high levels of human rights abuses. Wars are not started to rid the world of human rights abuses. Wars do just the opposite of that 
They are also the opposite of spreaders of democracy and could not be launched by a functioning democracy. Since the US overthrew democracy in Iran in 1953 and empowered the Shah until 1979, the Shah's son has been spending time in the Washington DC suburbs, reportedly on the CIA payroll, and awaiting his turn. I think the relative lack of bloodthirsty support in the United States for a war on Iran right now is in part people having learned from the past, and in part the failed propaganda of building up former Iranian President Ahmadinejad as an evil dictator, and then him getting voted out, which is an odd thing to happen to a dictator. <laughs> Dictators and royal heirs are not particularly popular, which may also explain why we've never heard very much about the Shah's son. How did we get to where we are in US-Iranian relations? through decades of warmongering and lying, and through Congress refusing to prevent war, or to impeach for war, or even to stop increasing the world's largest military budget every year. What we need to do now is to act both short and long term. We need to prevent a new war and end the existing ones. We also need to move in the direction of demilitarization more generally. We can't put this whole country into a witness protection program if it turns against its mafia ways, but we can act as if we don't want to be recognized as what the US government used to be. One place to start is by demanding that US troops finally get out of Iraq. Whether we pretend that they're there to spread democracy among the people who have demanded they leave, or whether we admit that they're there to steal oil, the occupation is a criminal and counterproductive enterprise. Getting US troops out of Iraq would be an enormous boost to movements to get US troops out of dozens of other nations they have no business being in. If the US and Iraqi publics were to both loudly demand the departure of US troops from Iraq, and succeed, that lesson might do more for the cause of democracy on Earth than 10 million targeted strategic murders. Thank you. Uh.